Okay, it is four o'clock, so we shall get things started. Our speaker today is a friend of mine and of the department, is our very own Wes Ferris. We're very grateful to have him today, and uh, especially when it comes to introducing him, normally when you introduce a speaker, you do some research into their work, and you learn a little bit about how they've gotten where they are, and what you think they can contribute to the audience. But Wes's talk today is about how he got here, what he has done, and what his position is today. So I consider myself relieved of that. I asked him how he would like to be introduced, and the summary he gave me was, for someone who doesn't like teachers, it's strange that I became a teacher. So with that said, let's welcome our very own Wes Ferris. Well, thank you. First off, I have a name, uh, Wes Ferris. Um, so do you have a name too? Packed room. So anybody ask, say, oh, it's a packed room. And so how did I come up with this idea? Pretty sure you won't starve or why I didn't go to Harvard. Well, I'll go with the second part first, which was just a joke between Tom and I until I saw it on the, uh, the uh, actual uh, print, printed out uh, coming attractions. It's, it's an old joke from P.J. O'Rourke, who used to be a humorist and now is a, kind of a commentator of some sort. But anyway, the other part is actually something I truly say to students. Every now and then I am blessed with, uh, in the classes that I teach, with somebody who's going to come over and major in uh, astronomy or physics. And so when they talk to me about it, uh, they, they ask me, and I say, well, you know, I, I don't think you're going to be famous, don't think you're going to be rich, I'm pretty sure you won't starve, because I haven't starved. And uh, it's, that's pretty obvious, but um, it's really true. And so what I wanted to share with you is the idea of, of what that means uh, and what a career could look like, uh, you know, say if you aren't, you know, Albert Einstein or the person I keep thinking about when I, I'm up here is somebody who watched me lecture one day and I didn't know who he was at the time, I didn't recognize him, Leonard Susskind. He sat in the back of the room and watched me one day. And boy, if I, if I had known, I wouldn't have been able to get three words out. So um, I'm glad I didn't. And he came up and told me he liked my lecture, and so I've held on to that thought ever since. But all right, so here's, here's how it starts. It starts as a slightly depressed second year undergraduate physics major. Uh, none of you have ever been in that position yet. Undergraduate physics major, slightly depressed, right? Uh, I, I asked a graduate student friend of mine, what was the good of becoming a mediocre physicist? This was in my head, it was in my head for weeks. I, I, you know, I'm, one of the things you learn about learning as you study science, at least what I've discovered, is just how little you know. And it's hammered into you daily, right? And you just pick it up. And so I was feeling pretty low. But uh, Rex, and that was his name, was taken aback by my question. He sort of looked at me as if I'd grown two heads. And he said, uh, he re replied with something like this. Think of what you're saying, those two words don't even belong together. And he could, he like spit out, mediocre physicist, right? And he said, think about the things you already know. Because the moment you learn them, you kind of take them for granted. You know, forget the struggle that it took to get there. You, you just know, oh, well, everybody knows that, right? And that kind of made sense. Well, today, he's the provost at our alma mater here at the University of Akron. He's the provost. Um, and me, I am extremely proud to say that I teach here. And it's, uh, in many ways, in my opinion, the pinnacle of my career. Um, so, how I got here, um, to paraphrase uh, some guys called the dead, uh, is a long, strange trip. And it's why I have the primary title of my talk. Now, I really liked this place when I first got here because they had colloquiums. Where I came from, Akron, we had colloquiums as well. Hopefully it's a tradition that exists all the way around. Love it. Um, and 
it's, I think, totally enriching. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, didn't it start at Los Alamos? They had colloquiums at Los Alamos, at least. So it goes back at least to the 1940s and probably further back than that. Um, well, so by studying physics and astronomy, have it starved. Uh, I have a very interesting, interesting life, right? And I would point out this. Uh, at a colloquium, I heard a Nobel laureate say that physics was the liberal arts of science. And based on all the things that I have done, I, I can't dispute that. I, I think that may be just true. Maybe he's correct. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that you know the various types of physical scientists can't do one way or the other. Um, so let's go back. How did I get here? And first, my origins. And this this is uh, this is similar. I grew up in a place where. Star Trek actually happened. And after being born in Miami, Florida, uh, soon to be underwater, as I understand it, uh, but not yet, um, I grew up in Cocoa Beach, Florida, six miles from Cape Canaveral, from the pads, and about eight miles from Patrick Air Force Base, one on each side, north and south. Right? Um, my father was a mechanical engineer who worked at Cape Canaveral from 1954 until he passed away in 1986. He did all sorts of really engineering type things. Um, he was part of the team that installed the tracking stations for the Eastern Missile Test Range, uh, starting all the way in places like uh, Ascension Island, all the way to Johannesburg and Pretoria. So the actual tracking networks for first the ICBM development and then later for the uh, uh, part of the network that was communicating with the uh, astronauts in Project Mercury. He also worked with uh, Gordon Cooper in developing what was called the cherry picker, which was this device, if things went bad on the ground with a mercury redstone, they would put this thing over, they'd pop the hatch, they'd get in this thing. It was sort of like those things you see um, linemen work on high tension lines. It was one of those sort of a crazy thing. Put them down, and then they would scurry off into a bunker. Uh, and then if the redstone blew up, well, it didn't really matter that much. So, um, so you could say that space is in my blood. This is the day before my 10th birthday, and I'm pointing at John Glenn. Uh, this went out on the wire, as I understand it. And it's, it's really interesting that the two, two other guys are my dumb brothers. Um, but there's a couple important things. First off, in my teens and early 20s, having that birthmark was very important. Self-identification on Saturday mornings sometimes. Uh, and it's this proof here that I actually have been wearing Converse All-Stars longer than most people are alive. Um, but that was, space was in my blood. All right, uh, here is Alan Shepard. And here is a relatively I'm tired of being in the glee club. I'm tired of being in the hot sun. Here I am. Um, right there. Uh, so yeah, history was just right there. Um, but uh, glee club's important because like the characters on the island in Cat's Cradle, the only piece of technology that really caught my attention at first was the electric guitar. And so this is what I was now. This next picture I'm about to show you is, dates back to the 1970s, and I really debated, should I put it in or not? Right? Uh, but then I started thinking, well, Leonard Susskind was a plumber. If he was a plumber and could get away with it, I could probably get away with this picture. <laughs> All right, find me in this picture. Uh, you have to paste in a lot of hair and some other stuff, but uh, there I am. So, uh, so, so, after traveling the United States, playing for quite a while, I found myself in the Akron, Cleveland area, uh, still playing music, uh, not being particularly successful, but you know, 
uh, raising a couple of kids, doing all that sort of stuff. And just sort of living my life. My, my ex-wife wanted me to be a, a postal carrier, um, but I kind of had ambi other ambitions. And in the late 1970s, some guy spoke to me. And I never knew him, but he did something absolutely amazing. He told me something that after, after Vietnam, after Watergate and stuff, I really hungered for. He told me about this discipline that was self-correcting. That was the big takeaway that I, I took from Cosmos. There's, there's a place where there's something self-correcting. You, you're not right now, but someday you'll be righter than you are now, and you'll continue to strive towards perfection. I said, boy, that's, that's the kind of thing that appealed to me very deeply. And besides the fact that he was talking about stars and galaxies and all the things that I loved anyway. So I enrolled in college at the University of Akron majoring in astrophysics. I spent a large portion of the next decade hanging out in this room, in the rooms here. That's Air Hall, um, where the physics department and the math department and the statistics department all hang out. So. Uh, similar to this, you know, similar to Darwin Hall. And then later on in graduate school, I moved over to the Polymer Palace, um, which was the Institute of Polymer Physics at the University of Akron. It's uh, relatively uh, famous. Um, they have what they call the Polymer Triangle. I believe it's Youngstown, Akron, and uh, possibly Case Western Reserve up in Cleveland, where they do an awful lot of polymer studies. So, why polymers? Well, uh, my graduate research involved solid rocket propellant. Uh, I was a thiocol scholar. And oddly enough, solid rocket propellant is a polymer composite. You take something like, oh, polycaprolactone or HTPV, and you mix a whole bunch of volatile materials into it. Allow, allow it to harden in what's called a mandrel, which has a particular shape on the inside, and then you stick it in a rocket casing, and you ignite it. Once you ignite a solid rocket motor, we're not talking a liquid rocket engine, but a solid rocket motor, once it's lit, it doesn't turn off. So you better do it right. So there is an issue, though, because how you turn it on is you turn it on with an electrical spark. But these materials are quite resistant, almost dielectrics. And so ESD proved to be a real problem. That's electrostatic discharge. And that's what I was supposed to be working on. Electrostatic discharge, first I have to ask a question. What's the difference between something that's burning real fast and an explosion? And the answer is, not a whole heck of a lot. Right? The question is, did you light it in the right place? And the trouble was is that if you build up static charge, just the same way sometimes when you put your sweater on or take your sweater off, you start building up an electric charge, sooner or later it might reach a um, position where you'd have electrostatic discharge, where it'd have a, a breakdown, and the moment that spark flies from one place to another, it'd go off but it's not in the right place, and it's usually like when you're taking the plastic off of the rocket casing, or when you're putting it on the launcher, or something like this, so every now and then, a rocket would go up. And so this was a, this was a big problem, a serious problem, um, particularly when you consider, what's the stuff they pour into this, these, uh, these polymer matrices. Um, first of all, one thing they would pour into it is uh, ammonium perchlorate. That's one of the things that would really burn radically. Another thing would be very finely and specifically ground aluminum. And anybody who's fooled around with aluminum knows it'll burn. And then sometimes, to make the material more flexible, when you're making a polymer, you put in something called a plasticizer. Now, automobile tires have a plasticizer, and you can see over time it comes out. It's that grayish bloom that you see on tires that have been out in the sun. 
right? Well, the plasticizer in this case is nitroglycerin. <laughs> and that's uh, what they use to keep it flexible, right? And sometimes it sweats. And then you have to go wipe the nitroglycerin off of the rocket case. All right, so my task was to lower both the volume and surface resistivities of the propellant matrix. That was, that was my job. Um, the director of the Institute of Polymer Science and the department chair uh, at the Department of Physics, they were my bosses. And so that was my job. All right, so this marks one of the first successful uses of microscopic carbon nanotubes. So to show you how what you're learning might apply, just this last week in 210B, I taught volume resistivities. So I taught people rho and what to do with it. So yes, this is, this is something that you'll actually see in your course, in your classes, right? The stuff, that stuff that's in your books, it really matters, right? So the carbon nanotubes, these things had like an 1,000 to 1, um, 1,000 to 1 aspect ratio. They were uh, about 50 angstroms across. They were like giant long macaronis, hollow. And you're trying to put them into a highly filled polymer composite. And this went on and on and on. And so I've got, I've got my uh, graduate advisor. Do something. Make this work. Uh, I've got the head of the Institute of Polymer Physics uh, telling me, make this work. Uh, so I'm answering to a department chair and a dean. And I'm just this lowly graduate student, right? Uh, and so I go and I check with all the polymer scientists. I know, how can I get this stuff in there? Because it's similar to like trying to put a bunch of air in honey. That's exactly what it was like. You can stir it, you can mix it, you can pound it, you can prod it, and you end up with a bunch of bubbles and, and, and very terrible distribution. It's not uniformly distribution. You don't have a, a homogeneous material. You've got it. Right? And so I ask and I ask and I ask and I try all these things and time is running out, time is running out until one day I sit and say, well, everything these people are telling me isn't helping me much. I started thinking about it. And I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. They'll string me up if they know I'm going to do it, so I'm going to do it on a Sunday. I went in to the, uh, the Institute of Polymer Physics on a Sunday afternoon made up a batch of my simulated propellant. They wouldn't let me use real nitroglycerin, so we used something that was similar. Had similar electrical properties, uh, viscosity properties, the whole thing. And used that and mixed up a batch of this, got out um, respectable like a half weight percent of carbon fibers for it, put it in a shake cup, put it on the shake machine, and whipped it up. Well, now it's filled with bubbles, totally useless. Nobody can use this stuff. I put it in a vacuum oven and pump down on it for a couple of hours. All the bubbles come out. I pour it in the mold and leave it alone for a couple of days, allow it to uh, cure, and then take it and show it to my boss. Nothing succeeds like success. And then we were able to do it. So. This is what we were up against. Here's the HTPB-based model rocket propellant, all by itself, no carbon fibrils. Volume resistivity, 2.5 times 10 to the 13 ohm centimeters. You add a tenth of a weight percent, and you drop a couple orders of magnitude. We're about an order of magnitude. It starts to drop. Still isn't quite where we would want. It's still very high. Uh, so we try a quarter of a weight percent. And now we're getting somewhere. But at a half a weight percent, the bottom drops out. We've hit the percolation point. 
happening. This interesting though is that when we finally get the bottom to drop out, there's a certain amount of little activity going on. Little little areas where maybe the impedance, uh, the resistance is slightly lower than other places. But um, this is this is a big deal. How how big of a deal this is? Thiokol gets wind of it. They fly me out to Ogden, Utah. Um, and take me out to where they mate the peacekeepers, the tridents, Poseidons, with their warheads. It's north of Great Salt Lake. It's about 12 miles from Idaho, in the middle of nowhere, for good reason, for a lot of good reasons. It's in bleach cow skull country. And they sit there and they go through all my belongings and confiscate all my lighters and stuff, anything I can make fire with. They issue me flame-proof steel-toed shoes and an asbestos lab coat. And they take me and my little measuring device and they lock me up in a room with two other guys dressed the same way and we do the same test with real propeller. Uh, we lived. And this was the most amazing place I think I was ever at because they had all these little manhole covers all through the place. These little manhole covers, uh, easy with a handle, you could pull them up and say, if there's a thunderstorm, go get in one of those and don't come out. Because there's all this stuff around. So that's what I did. And I actually delivered it. It's the only time I've ever spoken to the American Physical Society, to the actual uh, meeting, all by myself. And uh, because my research group didn't come until later in the week. It's the only time, including today, when I ever had dry mouth. I, 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 it's all the room filled with all these people. It was just, it was uh, crazy. But that's how I got my degrees. Yes, sir? What is the axis of that graph? What's that? What is the axis of that graph? Axis? Horizontal axis. This, this horizontal, this one? Yeah. Time. Are you just measuring it over time? Yeah, just measuring it oh. over time. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I took these out of my thesis, so I was trying to copy them, and so some of the axis labels and stuff. But, uh, pretty impressive. Yeah, I was pretty happy. All right, so after graduating, I, I got, I, I, I don't know, can, can you have a postmasters the way you do a postdoc? I certainly did one. Uh, I got sent to Lewis Research Center. It's now Glenn Research Center, Cleveland, Ohio, and the Engineering and Propulsion Materials Group. And we were working on jet engines. And jet engines, every now and then, you, you might not realize this, but even on commercial airlines, jet engine fan blades fall apart. They're spinning really fast and they're on, extreme temperatures, extreme conditions, cold air rushing in, um, they f fall apart. And when they fall apart, they have a tendency to do things like pierce the engine next to them or go into the cabin, which is even worse. So they have, around jet engines, they put a whole bunch of metal so that these things do fall apart. They're contained inside the engine that failed. Uh, but that's a severe weight penalty, and these days with fuel prices and stuff, that was a problem. So the idea was, is there had been developed some Kevlar-like fabrics that um, were capable of withstanding extremely high temperatures. So we wanted to test these things. So we tested these things using a helium gun in a uh, abandoned uh, nuclear reactor. They assured me it was absolutely clean and decontaminated and the fact that I'm still here uh, indicates that they probably were telling the truth. It was right down the street from the famous, some of you may have heard of this, the chicken cannon. You know about the chicken cannon? They used to go to the grocery store, buy a bunch of chickens and fire these chickens using a helium gun into airplanes. Chickens already dead. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. No, no live chickens were harmed in this, this experiment. Just, yeah, they would go by the grocery store, pick up these chickens, and fire them 
uh, in there. So right down the street from there, that's where I was, we had our own helium gun with a burst disk. And the very first thing, very first job that I had was to write a computer program to uh, use light gates to determine how fast the projectiles we were going to be firing into this material would go. So that was my first job, and light gates. So below a certain speed, everything was perfect and linear. Above a certain speed, everything was perfect and linear. It was a very simple program. Um, uh, probably dates back to your first physics course. It was a simple kinematics equation. But there was this big gap in the middle because we were using the light gates. And I'm going, oh, it couldn't get to work. Couldn't get to work. Just get total garbage through there. It was the transonic zone. And what's happening is the shock waves of the, part of, of the uh, projectiles as they're going through are distorting the information. So what are we going to do? We have this really great, nice straight line. And right over here, we have this beautiful, nice straight What are we going to do? And so I correlated the pressure of the helium behind the burst disk to the velocity of the particles. And it matched the lines on both sides and allowed me to draw a line through the transonic zone. So through that. So that was, that was the first big thing. Um, the data acquisition program. So I wrote a little subroutine in it and said, when you get to this fast, don't pay any attention to what you're reading. Uh, look at the pressure of the right, right before you fire. And that worked. The next thing was um, nobody could figure out how to make the tungsten slugs. And so this is where in the finest tradition of American physics, which has never been afraid to get its hands dirty, um, I got my hands dirty. I uh, avoided the IG, the Inspector General, and snuck over into the machine shop with some uh, tungsten uh, round stock and had somebody work, teach me how to use a metal lathe. I had used wood lace before, I never used a metal lathe. And I designed the prototype slugs. Took them back, showed them to everybody, said, will this work? And every guy said, oh, yeah, that's great, thanks. Where, how'd you do this? I said, oh, I went over to the machine. You were in the machine shop? The IG see you? No, he didn't see me. Um, NASA was amazing. It was sort of like a combination military-based college campus, but the difference between a college campus and, and NASA was NASA had lots of money, but people were hard to come by. Whereas anybody who's worked in a graduate research program knows that money's hard to come by. You've got to go asking, and, but you have plenty of people. They're called graduate students. Right? So uh, it's kind of the opposite of what, what we would experience, say, here. So I prototyped those, got those, and then built a jig, and we just ground them out hundreds at a time. And then there was a means to heat treat large numbers of the fabric samples. To bring them up to jet engine temperature, not having them touch each other, just expose them so then we could put them in our little heated target zone and fire the slug at them. Well. And again, everybody was at a loss, so I snuck into the machine shop again, this time with aluminum stock. I cut a bunch of little pieces of aluminum, like so, drilled holes through them so they all lined up, got myself a couple of screws, would lay down a piece of fabric, lay down one of these, piece of fabric, another one, piece of fabric, another one, and then run through the bolt and bolt them and hang them up in the oven. And that's what was used. So once again, an American physicist is not afraid to get their hands dirty. And so, yeah, so do what you gotta do. So, did that. And all of this effort got me, along with the other five people involved, a NASA Group Achievement Award, which is one of the few things I'm extremely proud of that I, that I have. So, that's kind of cool. So once again, and uh, they actually they paid pretty good, uh, which was like the first time in my life I'd been paid pretty good. Uh, so that was a surprise. Um, next thing is a friend put me on to uh, 
an experiment, I, I, I guess you'd call this biophysics, uh, a medical research project at Akron General Medical Center. They were studying electromagnetic fields in cancer, which was a big deal in those days. Uh, people thought that this was a very serious problem. So this was my first non-university related job. They asked me, uh, what would you charge? And I said, well, I, I was paid this much at NASA. They'd probably pay me that much. And so that's what I told them. I, I'm not a negotiator, so I didn't negotiate. I said, pay me this. Which was a good thing because they had had an electrical engineer that had used most of their budget. And his idea of putting an electric field inside a sample of cancer cells was to stick a wire in it. But the moment you put a wire in there like that, it's, it's like um, electro-coating. You're changing the chemical nature of the material. And of course, the cancer cells die. Now, if you could do that inside a person, that would be great. But uh, <laughs> as far as an experiment is concerned, not so good. So their budget, their, their budget had been pretty much used up. And they, they asked me, is there something you can do here? Well, the first thing I did, I said, OK, let me see all the papers that you've got from other, other people. And I'm seeing all these claims of just these fabulous results with magnetic fields that are just so small that the lights in this room would, would drown them out. And so I'm highly suspicious of much of what I see. And I say, you, you're going to have to go higher than this to, to, to have something. So they had no money. And so I go home, and I'm sitting in my house. And because I'm a musician, I got all sorts of wire around, including bell wire. And I go to the kitchen, I pull out a Quaker Oats box, empty out the oats, and knock the bottom out. I attach two pieces of aircraft plywood on either side, model aircraft plywood on either side, put a tray on the inside, wind it with bell wire. Take it into the university, say, hey, can I borrow the hull probe? Sure, you can borrow the hull probe. Uh, put it on a controlled power supply and verify, you know, uh, with this much current, this much magnetic field on the inside. But solenoid, absolutely consistent on the inside. So I just developed this, and they like it so much, I end up making like four of them, so we ate a lot of oatmeal. And uh, bring them in. So I do that. And uh, then for the electrical fields, uh, they had plastic petri dishes. All right? And I'm not going to stick a wire in there. I'm not going to kill the samples. So what I do is I get aluminum flashing. Remember, this is a budget. And I epoxy aluminum flashing to, on either side of the Petri dish, make a little contact so you can hit it with alligator clips. And then I go through and I figure out what this stack of various capacitances will be. And I apply an electric field that I can estimate what it is on the inside uh, and where the samples are. Then I spec power supplies for both the magnetic field, controlled, controlled current, and for the electric field, just regular old control voltage. I spec power supplies that they can actually afford and meters that they can actually still afford. I give them all this list of stuff, and the <coughs> next thing I know, they're doing it. And what they're doing is they're exposing human mammary cancer cells, so breast cancer cells, to these electromagnetic fields, and then when they've done it over a period of time, they stick it into rats. They inject it into rats and see what happens. Apparently, this is a standard process for, you know, for biologists and, and medical researchers. They just poke the rats. Well, so that's what I did. So I spec this material, and then. Uh, this was all carried out in a lab marked laundry. Big letters above the building, laundry. It's the only laundry I ever saw that had a keypad that you had to know the combination to get into, right? Now, that was because there are people who are really worried about our friends the rats. But my opinion is given all the things rats have done to us, I haven't got a problem with it. You know, if they were cute little puppies or something, maybe. But rats, no. No, no, you bet you're your Yersinia pestis. No, sorry. All right, so 
and results were presented. So I'm pretty happy with that too. And I made a little money, not a lot of money, but it's, it's never been about the money too much. So until then, I had a daughter in private high school uh, who had already been accepted by Northwestern. That kind of focused my, my thinking. So even though I was the one, one physics student at Akron, the time I was there, that didn't talk about Needle Park. Needle Park is GE's research and development center up in that part of the world. I was the one who uh, wanted to do astrophysics. That was what I wanted to do. But I wound up working for a lighting company anyway which isn't too far from it because you use the same tools. Uh, except instead of taking a spectra of a distant star or diffuse nebula or something like that, what you're doing, you're taking a spectra of a light you've designed. And you, you don't have to use a spectroscope and a telescope, you use an integrating sphere. But it's the same sort of, uh, same sort of work, same sort of science. Right, so that's what I did. So I started out as a lamp development physicist Worked my way up to manager of product engineering um, and then closed out my career by moving to Urbana, Illinois to Anderson Physics Labs, which is a remarkable place. It was the one place within this corporation that still had a viable R&D department. It had been started as a private company by Dr. Scott Anderson. Scott Anderson was a member of the Manhattan Project. He was still alive when I worked there. He passed away, you know, I guess about 15 years ago now. Blind as a bat, came into work three days a week, and he'd have to look at things like this right up to his face, but his mind was one of the sharpest minds I've ever seen. He could ask the most vexing questions. Um, he was famous. Um, they had a problem back, I guess, around 1944 that the, uh, for, for little boy, is that the uranium kept oxidizing. So he went away for two days on his own and worked until um, he came back with stainless uranium. He figured out how to make stainless uranium, uh, and that was his, his gift to the Manhattan Project. I'm pretty sure that how to do that is a secret that none of us will ever know. But uh, no stainless uranium, think about that. Um, he then later on developed this way of making halide pills, little tiny halide pills, metal halides, uh, absolutely precisely. And I can't go into a lot of details, very proprietary, but they used amplifiers, same kind of thing that I would use, uh, for other reasons, to vibrate little tiny orifices in such a way that the very precise small drops would come off uh, of these halides, and by the time they, they hit the next surface, they're already cooled and solidified. And this process is used to this day for uh, making metal halide lamps. So that's why advanced lighting technologies bought it up. But that was uh, perhaps the coolest place I ever worked. Uh, had an R&D, an ongoing art research and development uh, program, and I was a research and development physicist. Here's, here's the meat and potatoes of what we were doing. These are high-intensity discharge lights. And this is the next thing that I learned how to do. All right, so clearly a lot of E and M is involved here. What you do is you wind up with a plasma column in there. Um, you can tell that you've had a plasma column because your resistance goes to zero, which is why you have to have uh, transformers that limit the current. Otherwise, they'll suck everything out of the wall until they explode and the wall catches on fire. So it's a little different from your normal lighting. But you have these electrodes, plasma column in there. Uh, and what starts off the reaction is mercury vapor. You have mercury in there, mercury vapor. But anybody who's looked at a mercury spectrum knows that it's downright disappointing. 
uh, even worse than low pressure sodium. So what you do is you want to put other metals in there and get other emission lines. But metals have really high melting points and don't work too well that way. So what do you do? You put in instead of, uh, oh, say, sodium ion or any number of halides, which have much lower melting points. The moment they hit that column, they dissociate. The iodine just sort of hangs around to cause trouble later, but the metals enter into the column and suddenly you get all these different uh, emission lines that you wouldn't have otherwise. So uh, iron, cobalt, thallium, uh, all sorts of things. Cobalt enhances UV. Um, so all these different things possibly. So I worked at the specialty discharge portion. So I designed a lot of lamps like this without an outer jacket. So no jacket around it, no inert gas. So getting these pinches, this is just amorphous silica. Getting these pinches right and not allowing any air to get here where it's very hot on the order of about 800 C up there, but right there. Get those, uh, any reaction, chew up those leads, and then you get uh, bad news. Uh, this is the other type. This is when you design it with an outer jacket. You fill it with uh, inert material, nitrogen usually, on the outside. And this works, lasts a lot longer. These things are about 20 times more efficient than incandescent. But they have, to this day, been pretty much supplanted by LEDs, which are many, many times more efficient than even that. But back in the 90s, this was hot stuff. Um, so let's see. So much of what I did is proprietary, but I can tell some, I can tell some tales. Uh, I have, I've signed numerous non-disclosure agreements in my life. Uh, but uh, the first thing I did is we had a type of lamp that was really useful for aquariums. It used indium iodide. And that gave you a really beautiful blue color. Um, but somehow it worked, it interacted with the materials used for the foil lead junction and led us to unexpected separation of lamp components, which is industry way of saying the darn thing blew up. Uh, I call them boomers, but my boss told me I couldn't say that probably. Um, but I carried out a test where I removed the foil, the actual welding tab from the foil, and made some samples where there was no welding tab, just put the lead right on the foil, and suddenly the reaction went away. So that led to a development of a different type of thing there. I established with a Geiger counter that the coating of electrodes with thorium powder needed to be done by professionals. Right? That it should not be done by as talented as they were workers in the factory. It just was a bad idea. And uh, I had to stand up to my boss to do this, but that also led to my first contact with APL because they're the ones who wound up doing it. They had the skills and the smarts to do it whereas a regular manufacturing factory did. So that's it. That led to me being the uh, radiation safety officer. I had my NRC training. How many of you have had modern physics? Well, uh, to, pass, to pass my uh, NRC, get my NRC certificate, it took nothing more than a few trips back to my modern physics books. You guys don't sell your books to me. I still have all my books and I've been in them ever since I graduated, I don't know how many times. Um, a lot. All right, so I solved a, uh, all right, once again, unexpected separation of lamp components problem with soccer sports lighting in the UK called MBILs. Um, much this again to the chagrin of my boss, uh, since it had no outer jacket, it's just a long tube like this, exposed to the air. Um, the leads were oxidizing and boom! Uh, so 
I developed a platinum-clad lead. Platinum is inert, right? And the problem went away. Um, much to the chagrin of my boss. Uh, she did not like the idea of coating the leads in platinum, but it worked. So that, that kept us in business, right? Um, right? I developed a new lamp from the above soccer lamp that is used to this day in portable construction lighting. If you're driving at night and pass by a construction site, you know those uh, generators and then they have a pole with four lights up there? If you can see into the lights, if they're not too bright, if you find that they don't have an outer jacket, they're just long tubes, those are mine. They're called Moby lights. And I developed them from a previous design. Right? Uh, I investigated a first-hand problem at the Palais des Congrès in Paris. We sold them a bunch of colored lights that were supposed to be the tree color, though it was more like white, blue, and pink. It really wasn't all that red, because anybody who knows about emission spectrum knows that red's hard to come by. Um, but, yeah, but there were all sorts of problems. The ADLT UK had sold them bad ballast. The French didn't even know how to turn them on. And, and there was some weak art tubes. But I, I spent several hours being yelled at by about 12 French people uh, while a Belgian interpreter would interpret for me. Uh, so I'm sitting there talking. And so I'd get up to calm down. And it, it was one of my yokel moments. I looked out a window, just trying to gather my thoughts. and. You want to see Eiffel Tower. And so for a moment, I said, Oh, she looks gorgeous. You know where you are, Florida boy? Uh, and just you know, felt really silly. But managed to get it to the point where they were happy again. I saw the Palais de Congrès uh, last winter. I uh, went to Paris briefly. And the tour driver was talking about the Palais de Congrès. He said, Yeah, you know who did the lights there? <laughs> ah, that was great. Um, Right? So, I was the first introduction into graphic art lamp, enhanced UV lamp design, uh, for Krypton 85 at 0.5% uh, Krypton 85 and solved the restart problem. Uh, and when you're doing graphic arts, you want to turn the lamp off, turn the lamp on, turn the lamp off. The lamps don't want to turn back on once you've turned them off and they're still hot because they have such tremendous pressure, it's impossible to get breakdown. But if you add a few little ions cruising around in there, they are a little more amenable to starting over again. So I introduced it, and the results were fabulous. Uh, what I did is they were using uh, like 5% krypton in the smaller bulbs that they would use for, say, something like that. Right? Uh, but I'm talking big things like this. You can't put that much in there. The radiation would be a problem. So we just did it with like 0.5%. And it worked. I also, with a buddy of mine, a guy named Klaus Wogenauer, developed high CRI color rendering index lighting for the Athens Olympics for a company out of uh, uh, Iowa called Musco. So the high CRI lighting for the Athens Olympics. And then, I guess uh, while decertifying a factory site, there was <coughs> unacceptable radiation. And they didn't know where it was. So they cleaned up everything. Before. Where's this radiation coming from? And so the, the chief radiation officer from the entire corporation is sitting there. We're, we're going through it together. And I go, they've turned off the HVAC. This is coming up out of the ground. This is radon. And that's what it was. Turn on the HVAC, and we can decertify the factory. Um, so those were kind of my, my uh, inventions, my, my adventures there. Um, then uh, I was sent out from Urbana to learn technology of a newly acquired company, DSI. Anybody ever heard of it? Deposition Sciences. Uh, it's over on uh, what? Coffee Lane. Um, right? So. My job was to learn all the secrets of optical thin film coating and bring it back to the Midwest. Um, and I, I was doing it. I was 
able to run the coders, we were coding lamps, improving CRI, color rendering index, we are doing all sorts of wonderful things. And then the company went chapter 11 and said, well, we're gonna sell it to uh, BMW instead. So they sold the coder to BMW and said that. So I couldn't do anything. So they kept coming up with these silly little projects for me to do out here. And I finally asked my boss, I said, hey, why am I out here? He said, uh, both Urbana and Cleveland want a presence in Santa Rosa, and you're it. We don't care what you do, you just stay there. And I was a spy, essentially. I was just their eyes and ears, and I, I didn't particularly like that. So I said, you know what, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I've always wanted to do. I'm going to try and get a teaching job. I didn't know it was going to take four years, but it did. Um, but, right, so my first teaching job, which wasn't almost immediately, well, I was, um, I substitute taught, uh, using my physics degree and stuff, at uh, Cardinal Newman in Ursuline, where I paid back karma at a prodigious rate for every substitute teacher I'd ever tortured in my life. Um, <laughs> Paid it back, all right? Um, but then I had an interview at SRJC, <coughs> which oddly enough resulted in an emergency hire at College of Marin, where I met a fellow uh, by the name of Rob Chavez, who gave me a name. And after a very interesting phone interview, I got a job here teaching astronomy classes. And uh, also, the, somebody here in this room gave my name back to SRJC, which is where I got a job at SRJC. And so that's now I work here and at SRJC, and I love it. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to live a lot longer doing this than I ever would have continued uh, in corporate world. I'm extremely happy with what I do. Um, right. And so... I, I really enjoy teaching. Um, it's one of the best feelings on the planet when you watch a light bulb go off over somebody else's head. When you watch it light up, I said, rather than go off. Uh, I think some of you probably know this feeling. Uh, it's the greatest thing to create the next generation of people who are capable of thought. That is just wonderful, right? I can't think of anything better. It is a worthy endeavor. Well, and I've got to meet all sorts of interesting people. One of my heroes for years was Milton Humison. I met his great-great-granddaughter and his granddaughter uh, through teaching. And uh, his granddaughter sent me a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that she sent me was this letter. It's a Xerox. It's not the original. But it's a Xerox, and since I read a little bit of German, I just start reading, right? I don't, oh, I'm going to read this, right? I don't notice the signature down at the bottom. But I read about the spectrum and all this stuff, and then finally I get down here about losing. I actually have a copy of a, a letter with Albert Einstein's signature on it. This is just uh, one of my prized possessions. So by doing all this stuff through all these years, I've, I've picked up a few things that I would like to share with those, of, those who don't already know them. If you're going to study a science or a technical field, you better have the fire in the belly because it's, it's hard work. There's no easy way around it. You're going to slog no matter who you are. I don't care how bright you are. Passion is essential. You have to really want to do it. Uh, if you thought it through, ignore the advice of experts and try it at least once your way. Can't hurt. Don't let the fear of making a mistake stop your progress. One of the ways to figure out what's correct is by exhaustion. You just find all the things that don't work and what's left over, that'll work. So. That's one way, and that's a mathematical proof. It's called proof by exhaustion. It's real. Um, 
professionally, always be ready to speak truth to power. Right? Also walk in every day ready to be fired. And that isn't fatalism. That's just, that's liberating. If you walk in ready to lose your job, then you're willing to say what you need to say. You're willing to do what you need to do to get the job done. And so it's, it's, not, it's not fatal, right? Subordinates, and I include here line workers, right? Are fabulous sources of first-hand accurate information. Ignore what they tell you at your own peril. Um, it's a struggle, but try and learn how to listen. Part of my job when I was working at ADLT was called RTS, readiness to serve. So a certain amount of time every day, I had to go out on that factory floor and solve problems. And if you don't listen to the people that are out there all the time, you're going to, you know, some solution that won't work from above. But if you listen to them, you probably get closer to the answer. I watched water contamination go down the entire pipes one day, right? It started at this first machine here, second machine, third machine, fourth machine. Uh, I listened to the people and said, no, mine was working fine. Now it isn't working. And then eventually what I did is I said, okay, flush the line. They flushed the line and everything went back to normal. But you don't, if you don't listen to them, it's what happens is your own fault. If you're wrong, look them in the eye and say so. Once again, um, my old department chair when I was an undergrad, Roger Creel, ran the computations class for physics. And one day, he was doing one of those, um, what would you call it, um, Newton's Laws problems where you're in the elevator and you're pulling on the rope that pulls the elevator up and he couldn't solve it. And he looked us in the eye and said, for some reason I can't do this right now, I'll have it for you next week. And he walked in the next week and he had it. That's integrity. And I never forgot that. He's in Montana somewhere, still alive, retired, and up to no good, I'm sure. Um, and you will spend more time working in your career than you will with your loved ones. Do something that you love and makes you passionate. This is just so, and this, right? And this is my idea of relaxation, recreation. This is my picture of the uh, pillars of uh, creation in the real colors. And this is a barred spiral galaxy, uh, 55 million light years from here. I. I found it and decided to take a picture of it because I wanted to see what we would look like from very, very far away. And so we'd probably look something like that from very, very far away. And last but not least, I'm running out of time anyway. This is one of my most prized possessions. This goes back to the beginning. I wrote to Scott Carpenter years ago when I was a student. Uh, and worried about such things. I uh, didn't ask for an autograph or anything. I just, he had always been an inspiration. <coughs> he had been my astronaut because one day in Cocoa Beach he pointed to me and waved. And so I always, he was, he was my guy, right? And he was also the one of the Mercury 7 that was interested in science. He's the one who carried out experiments while he was up there, deployed balloons and did all sorts of strange things. Up there. Almost ran out of fuel. Um, right? So, part of my interest in science was following his career. He did all sorts of things even after he was an astronaut. Um, so, he wrote back to me a handwritten letter. And I'm pretty sure that he knew that a handwritten letter from one of the Mercury 7 is probably a lot more valuable than just an autograph. And certainly it is to me. So, these are some of the things I have, some of the things I've done. Uh, to quote Chico Escuela, for anybody who remembers him, 
physics has been very good to me. So, <laughs> so that's it. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, we are at five o'clock, so for those of you who are here for extra credit opportunities, if you could depart as quickly and quietly as you can, the rest of us will remain for a few questions. Thank you. Uh, get some rest. Sure. Thank you. What's that? No, no, you just fill out the form and the form's back. Okay. You get some points extra credit. Cool. I'll see you in a little bit. Yeah, see you in a little bit. No, this is the stamp for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. What's that? Oh, thank you. Okay, do we have any questions for our speaker? Not starve. It was, it was, a, it was a testament to, yes. to, to you. It was really very interesting. Thank you. So, uh, what's what's the fun part of, of physics now? Or fun part of physics? You still blow stuff up. Or? <laughs> well, I don't blow much stuff up anymore. But I, oh, the astrophotography, of course. Wonderful. Looking at the sky, you you know how much money I spend on that stuff. So, yeah. Uh, <coughs> You know, if, if I can't have Palomar, I'll try and make it myself. That's, that's always been my principle anyway, the DIY. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm now proud owner of an 11 inch. I have two different cameras and computers and stuff. Yes? Did you say Palomar? Yeah, if I can't have Palomar, I'll build it myself. In fact, my uncle actually has the original design for the Palomar Observatory. Oh, yeah? That's amazing. Well, that's so cool. The, the Hale telescope. Hale couldn't hear. He had done polar explorations and he had uh, knocked out his ears. He'd frozen his ears or something. So, so, okay. so you were successful, you know, when you used these nanotubes to lower the resistivity. Yes. I wonder after you left, anyone, you know, took the job and <laughs> continued to work and to keep uh, working. Thiokol was all over that, like, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, Thiokol took it over and was very, very quiet. There was talk about us getting paid at least for a bit, but then we published. And so Thiokol said, oh, you publish, so we don't have to pay you. Uh, but the, there was talk for a while that uh, Dean Kelly and, and Dr. Von Merrill and I were going to get paid mightily, and but of course that went away. But yes, it's actually used because uh, they use carbon to make uh, contrails less visible anyway, invisible. And uh, carbon when it burns is a very, makes a very, very small molecule which you can really accelerate so it actually has very few detrimental effects on the performance of the propellant. But yes, the there was plenty of follow-up, and now it's probably either all secret or proprietary. Do you still do research, or are there things that you um, still Mostly do? astrophotography. I am mostly obsessed with teaching, and I teach a lot. 
and I, I teach very large classes now, and that is a real passion of mine because we live in a world right now where pseudoscience and the occult have their own dedicated television channels and millions of dollars. And to sit there and at least advocate for rational thought, for the scientific method, and, and you know, reaching maybe one person out of 10, that is a, such a worthy enterprise in the world as it is today. There's, there's nothing I could do that would be better than that. Um, think about it. How much money do you think they spend on an episode of Ancient Aliens? Compared to, uh, you know, the money that's spent, you know, promoting actual science. I'd also like to extend a personal thank you to Wes. When I first arrived here, I had not taught too many classes, and of course you don't want to admit that to too many people. And Wes was a wonderful guy through those early days, and I remember I regard you as the man with a quote for almost any situation. And when I was sort of lamenting my early days as a teacher, I think the quote you gave me that best helped guide my, <laughs> my thinking was uh, that the, the dedicated take care of their time, and time will take care of the undedicated. That's how I put it. So. <laughs> That has stayed with me doing that. Let's have another hand for us, Peter. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.